it and let it go. All right, so we're going to start with this picture first uh, and just with descriptions, okay? Just description. So let's do it like this. First year describes, third year makes a diagnosis. How's that? Are there any third years? <laughs> it's first and third word year, right? Isn't it first and third? We have a little classes here. Really? Yeah. yeah. Isn't it that second and fourth go to CP lectures? Or is it not? No, we have we go to all the everyone, everyone goes to everything? No. Yeah, yeah. Alright, let's make it like this. First years describe everybody else's diagnosis. Okay? okay? Yeah. Let's make it like that. Um, expansion of the um, interstitial. And I like see here? A, mm -hmm. Yes. And I see a giant, a uh, multi-nuclear giant. Yes, what's that in there? In the multi-nuclear giant. What does it look like? This? Um, if I made it bigger, that shape, you know, like that. Like a vent. Sorry. Like a lens. Oh, oh yeah. finger hand. It's a cholesterol gland. Oh, cholesterol gland. Just, it's just a non-specific inclusion. Any macrophages, any giant cells can have that inclusion. It means nothing whatsoever about anything. But you're right, there's a giant cell. Where, really? In what, what compartment? In the airspace or in the interstitial? Interstitial. Interstitial. And what's behind it? So what's all this stuff? Of what kind? What cells are predominant here? Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. All right. So there's lots of lymphocytes in the interstitial. And there is a giant cell. And that's pretty much it, right? Anything yeah. in the airspace? And no. no. So this is an interstitial lung disease. Is that fair to say? It's a disease of the interstitial. There's basically nothing in the airspace. Now I will turn to a senior. Who is who? Gabe, wait, can we do you? Sorry. What do you, th what do you think this is based on that uh, description? I'm actually not sure. Uh, Aaron. I might go with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Yes, explain why. Well, the, the multinucleated giant cell is nice. The expansion of lymphohistiocytic infiltrate in the septa is nice. And I yeah. want to say I can stretch the bit at about 8 o'clock into a granuloma. The bit at 8 o'clock. Where, where is that? There? Right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a very, very ill-defined, right? Yes. Okay, let's uh, let's ignore that. Let, let's assume that's not a kind of a, but still this, the, your interpretation holds true, right? What if I remove the giant cell? Then what would this be? Still hypersensitivity pneumonitis? Could be. NSIP, right? you said. Or? NSIP, sure. That's so yes, the cellular variant of NSIP would be your differential, right? Mm -hmm. That would be. So that giant cell then becomes like a key finding in this situation. All right, let's go to the next one. And let's go to Iman, what is that? Uh, describe it, just describe it and, and yeah, just describe what you're seeing. So I see a fibroblastic fossa in the interstitium. Or fibroblastic proliferation in the Yes, yes, yeah. because once you say fossa, you yeah, are almost yeah. given the diagnosis anyway. What else can have fibroblasts uh, besides a fibroblast focus in it? I mean, besides a fibroblast focus, what else can have a fibroblast proliferation in fibroblast your blood? Fibroblast plug, right, or so-called Masson body. Yep. There is actually a third thing. Does anyone know? Where else do you get a fibroblast proliferation in in the lung? But it's neither a focus nor a nor a plug. In interstitial lung disease. That's in the organizing phase of DAD. That's where you also get fibroblast proliferation, but in the interstitial. So there's really three things where you can get fibroblast proliferation. So Imad says this is a Fibroblast, does it have inflammatory cells no. in it? No. Is it a branching in shape or dome shaped? Dome shaped. Airspace or interstitial? Interstitial. Um, does it have a kind of serpiginous configuration? No. no. Uh, is there a, um, like a bronchovascular bundle nearby that you can see at this I point? Think the, this is a bronchial lining. That, oh well, okay, that, I, that's fair. This is bronchial lining cell. Uh, yeah, that's, that's good. All right, so let us turn to a senior now. Who is senior? Josephine. So what is, what's the most likely diagnosis here? I'm not showing you any low mag, but given this finding, what do you think the pathology UIP. UIP is it is her thought. Okay, so then we, we go to the next one. I'm going to give you the answers during the talk and then we come back to this at the end, okay? All right, who's gonna take this? Who else is first here now? Jessica, you wanna do this? What's going on in this? It's a it's a needle biopsy, isn't it? It is. Yeah. What's going on? So I'm seeing multiple like fibroblastic proliferations. Multiple fibroblastic proliferations, correct? Um, and it looks like there's maybe there's 
some sort of inflammation. There's some sort of inflammation. <laughs> where? Like in the interstitial. In the interstitial. Perfect. In the interstitial. But where did these fibroblast proliferations do? Do you think? In the yeah. And what makes you think that? Like, what about the shape of it makes you think that it's inside the alveoli? Just because they're kind of like rounded and rounded. The yeah. pink and like yeah. inflammation is like around, like surrounding them. Look at this guy here. See how it like is like a U shape. Mm -hmm. That means it's going from one alveolus into another. Like it's following the contours of the alveolus spaces, like one corridor to the other, other one. Look at this one, I can almost trace it from here, goes into another one, expands, constricts, expands, constricts, expands. Right, so it would make sense that it's within the, within the alveoli. Um, what else can we say? Is there a bronchovascular, anything bronchovascular structures nearby? Uh, there is. Yeah, there's one there. There might be one up there. Okay, so she's done a good job. Now somebody else, we need a senior. Who else? Ayan, you want to do that? Um, I've seen a dot uh, fibroblast with uh, plaque. Yes, and what would be the diagnosis? Organizing pneumonia. Organizing pneumonia. Okay, we'll come back to this uh, later. All right, who wants to describe this one among the first years? So yeah. the interstitium is expanded. Yes. There is uh, some fibrosis there. Yes. It's very uh, ropey. Kind is of. it ropey? Okay. And uh, is there any inflammation or no inflammation? Uh, very bossy inflammatory. Okay. Um, any emphysema? Yeah. It, it is entirely emphysematic. It is. Okay. Yeah. And um, how about uh, lots of are there lots of macrophages in there? There are okay. there is RP. Yeah. There is RP. Okay. So I, I know where you're heading, but let me ask somebody else. Uh, may what do you 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 may or may not you don't have to accept his description. Tell me what your diagnosis mm -hmm. would be. Uh, multi Yeah. So you are ex accepting his description. <laughs> so you think it's it's SRI. Okay. We'll come back to this on at the end. And then uh, who wants who who which of the first year? Uh, Atsuko, are you first year? No, it's second year. Second year, no. So let's do first year. So, uh, Ellie, so describe this case. Um, there's debris within the um, alveoli. There's what within the alveoli? Uh, debris. Debris. Okay. Proteinaceous debris. Proteinaceous debris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? What What is this big old goomba in the in the center? Artifact. Concretion. Uh, concretion. Okay, something pink, right? For pink, can I send you that? How about the how about the interstitial? Is it like uh, super abnormal? Uh, Little bit abnormal. Uh, inflammation. Huh? Where? Where, where is the inflammatory cells? Like that? A couple months. Man, you're really stretching it, Ellie. <laughs> but okay, I'll give you maybe a, a but, but I really I don't I don't see anything at all. Um, you know I do see cells, but there are cells in the interstitial, right? There's pneumocytes. There's capillary endothelial cells, so maybe it might be that, one of those. So we did May, who's left? Four seniors. Um, all right, go for it. Pneumocystis. Pneumocystis. Okay, that's, that, that's an accepted. Any other seniors with an alternative diagnosis? <laughs> okay, and, and both are reasonable thoughts, and we'll, we'll come to why it's one versus the other. And actually part of the description uh, that any gave is relevant here yeah. in terms of what is this. All right, so we will start with just basic stuff, but we'll come back to these pictures at the end of the talk, and we'll see if you can get it right this time, if all of you can get everything right. All right, so the basic terms are this. If you have a bronchus or a bronchiole, that is called an airway. Is everybody okay with that? Bronchus or bronchiole is called an airway, and air space is a different thing. Air space is the lumen of an alveolus. So if this room is an alveolus, the air in here is the air space. This thing is the alveolar septum or interstitial. Is everybody okay with that? What would be the airway here? The hallway would be the airway that comes into the... And uh, so follow this analogy. Where is the respiratory bronchiole in this analogy? So this is the alveolus, the hallway is the airway. Where is the respiratory bronchiole? Where? Okay. Here, where between? Where would that be? The door. door. The door. Here, is the, here is the respiratory bronchiole. Look. It's half airway. Half airspace. Half airspace. So half of it is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium, and half of it is lined by flat alveolar lining cells. So the respiratory bronchiole 
is like a key thing. It's a key part of where one thing turns into another thing. But it's, it's interesting to understand that because you can understand why if you had a fibroblast plug in this airspace, it could extend into the bronchial tube, right? It's basically the same thing. There's just a, a passageway. So if you had a fibroblast plug in organizing pneumonia, that could go into the bronchial. If you had acute bronchopneumonia in here, this was all neutrophils and debris, that could go into the bronchial. So there's often bronchiolitis and bronchopneumonia together, right? If you aspirated into the bronchial, that could come into the airspace. You could just go doing this forever. If you have PAP here, that could go into that. It's all this thing is continuous. So there's, we try to break it into like, oh, this thing affects the alveoli, that affects the bronchioles, but it's basically one thing. It might affect more or less the. Okay, do you get that idea of the continuity and the respiratory bronchial? So these are the airspaces. Everybody okay with that? All right, so here are some examples of things that happen in the air spaces. Give me your best guess, guys. Top left? Um, What's that? Edema. edema, yeah. So edema is a classic airspace process. The heart gets, uh, you know, heart fails, things back up, and it just exudes into the airspace. Patient gets, you know, gets very severely distinct and short. So that's edema. How about this? What's in the airspace there? But there's giant cells, but there's also foamy macrophages, right? Yeah. So that typically happens in post-obstructive changes. When the bronchi bronchus or bronchiole is obstructed or even narrowed, you know, there's something going on in abnormal in the bronchiole, it's narrowed. Then why does it get foamy? Well, because the cells normally go, go through the bronchiole, right? Let's say we are on macrophages and then our normal process is to go through this and go, go out. Let's say the hallway is all blocked and we can't go out. Eventually, we just sit around in this room, degenerate, and then, then macrophages will come and eat up our debris and become foam. That's how you get this lesion. In the lung literature, this has a funny name. It's called endogenous lipoid pneumonia. It's weird. Why do we have to call everything pneumonia, right? It's kind of weird. But, but pneumonia means it's just abnormal. Right? Lipoid means that they're taking up the lipid from the degenerated cells. Endogenous means that the body made it on, on its own. It's not from the outside. Can you think of what would cause exogenous lipoid pneumonia? Anyone? Aspiration. Aspiration of what? Oh, fatty food. Fatty, you're very close. <laughs> I aspirate fatty food every day. <laughs> <laughs> No, aspiration, but something, fatty something. Aspiration. Mineral oil. Mineral oil. Yes, that's right. Why would you, why would anybody make mineral oil? What a dumb thing to do. Why does it, why do people take mineral oil? Does anyone here take mineral oil? I shouldn't be asking that. It's a very interesting question. But people, people take mineral oil for constipation. That's, that's the reason. La, la, there's laxatives, mineral oils. There are things like that that people take for constipation. And then if you are in a state where you're in a, at a risk factor for aspiration, sometimes you aspirate that stuff into your lung passages. And then that gives you foamy macrophages too that don't quite look exactly like this, but that's a different entity. It's called exogenous lipoid pneumonia. Do you get the, the reason you have two different terms? They're completely different things. One is you're aspirating something. The other is you're just, you know, you have a post-obstructive change. Okay, clear to everybody? What about the bottom right? What is that? Pneumonia. Yes, that's an acute pneumonia. I call it acute bronchopneumonia again because most of the time, what's in the bronchioles is also in the lung. So it's it's one process. I call it acute bronchopneumonia. And what you have in the air spaces in that is everybody, all of you have seen this, right? At autopsy, neutrophils, fibrinous debris, you know, bacteria and stuff like that, which you can pick out on a gram stain sometimes. But this is the classic appearance of an acute bronchopneumonia, and that is a classic airspace disease, right? So I'm showing you airspace diseases first, so you'll appreciate that indecision is the opposite of that. It's not in that space, it's in the, in, in the airway wall, in the wall. So this is indecision, it's here. Anything that's in here is interstitial, Every, anything that's here is airspace. And this is the big daddy of interstitial diseases. This, you know why it's called usual? 
because this is by far the most common thing. <laughs> it's by far. Anybody of any one of you have been on the lung service know this. UIP is what you, at the very least, UIP is the most common issue, if not the most common diagnosis. The issue is, is this UIP or not UIP? Is this UIP or not UIP? That always comes up. That's why it's called usual. And in fact, I think among the biopsied ILDs, I think UIP is, in my, at least in my experience, the most common thing, among the ones that come to biopsy. Now you could say, well, there are interstitial things that are more common than UIP, like SRIF is one. There's so many smokers, there's so many people who probably have SRIF, but they don't get biopsy, right? They're, those things just stay. They're just, they're, they have a clinical diagnosis of COPD. Who, is, who thinks of biopsy in those cases? But that probably is more common than UIP, right? In, in the general population. But when you think of biopsied ILDs, UIP is the big daddy of interstitial diseases. And what does pneumonia mean, anybody, in UIP? Pneumonia. Abnormal lung. That's all it means. It doesn't mean infection. Usual interstitial infection. How, how weird would that be? <laughs> That's not what it is. It means the usual kind of interstitial lung disease is UIP. That's why it was named like that. And that was way back in the 60s by Dr. Lebo, Avril Lebo. He was a very famous pulmonary pathologist. He basically invented all this <laughs> alphabet soup. But you know, before Lebo made that, there was no order in the, in the ILD thing. Clinicians just called everything IPF or Hammond Ridge syndrome. There was, it was just a mess of nonsense, which he tried to organize into some you know, useful things. Now, some of what Libo described was very, very old, even before immunohistochemistry. Some of that has become outdated, but his work was like the seminal work. And so he was first at Yale and then went to UCSD and became like the father of pulmonary pathology in the US. And then his students, Dr. Katzenstein, Dr. Carrington, they became the main people who trained, then Carrington trained Dr. Colby and other people they became like the major lung pathologists in the country. And all the people who now do lung pathology are their students. So that's where that comes from, the UIP thing. So UIP is the, the main diagnosis in interstitial lung disease. And this is what the radiology looks like. So on the top left, you see honeycombing. Is that clear to everybody? See, they make cysts. The cysts tend to be in the periphery of the lung. Uh, they are different to radiologists. They can tell these cysts from the cysts of, let's say, lamb. So they look different, but uh, there, is, there can be confusion on radiologic grounds between this and other things like traction rod cases. But honeycombing is one of the main findings in UIP from, from a radiologist's point of view. And the thing you guys should remember is that radiologists can make a confident diagnosis of UIP, which is very, very accurate if there is honeycombing. That's the key. If there is honeycombing, they can make a pretty accurate diagnosis of UIP. If there is no honeycombing, their diagnosis sucks. They, they are very, very bad at it. So, you know, they rely on, on things that overlap between UIP and NSIP. Actually, it's getting better now that they realize more and more that most of these things are, are UIP, not NSIP. It's getting better. So even, even without honeycombing, they're beginning to catch on that many of these things can be UIP. But remember, there are UIPs where you, there is honeycombing on biopsy, but you can't see it on the radiology. That's where pathologists come in. Those are the cases that need a biopsy, and those are the cases that will come to you. Now, just think about this. Now, if you think, well, you know, I'll just cheat a little and I'll look at the CT and I'll find out from there if it's UIP. What will happen? Well, if there was honeycombing, they wouldn't have biopsied it, right? So you're not going to get those cases. You are going to get the cases where there is no honeycombing. So you go back and look at the CT and you go, oh, the radiologist didn't see any honeycombing. This must be an SIP, but that's wrong. That's the wrong way to be thinking about it. You should be thinking, this is the situation where the burden is on me to decide whether this is UIP or an SIP. Does everybody get that concept about honeycombing and this? So in the current era, it's well accepted that radiologists can make a diagnosis of UIP in these cases. And then you don't need a biopsy. Actually, you don't want to biopsy patients because it's bad for them. You know, they, some of them get exacerbations and then there's the pain and the cost and everything that goes with a biopsy. So you want to go to biopsy only when the radiologic diagnosis is not possible. So is that clear to everybody? So that's the top left is honeycombing. The top right shows an area of traction from this is which is what it's basically just fibrosis pulling on an airway from all directions. So it just gets 
experiment. It's <coughs> not true, honey. And then here you see coarse reticulation, which means it just looks kind of like a web, kind of like a spider webby thing, little lines that you can see throughout the lung, which is different than other kinds of opacities like ground glass opacities, where it's just a diffuse haze, very kind of a light haze from which you can see the presence. So what do radiologists use? They use their features are patchy fibrosis. That, that means the reticulation is a little bit more in the periphery, like this, and a little bit less toward the center for them, right? They use the fact that the, in most cases, the fibrosis is more in the lower lobes and a little less in the upper lobes. And they use the fact that there is honeycombing in, in association with that. Once they have those features, they call it UIP. And then it goes to the clinician to decide whether they should label this as IPF or not. So that's how it, it goes in, in the radiologic setting. Here's another, now you see how it's distributed top to bottom. Where is it more, top or bottom? Bottom. Yes. Is there no fibrosis at top? There is fibrosis. There is fibrosis. And now there's a very interesting phenomenon. So people who are taught bottom, bottom heavy UIP, bottom heavy UIP, basilar predominant UIP, if you flip it and give them more fibrosis at the top, they go, well, that can't be UIP. But, but that makes no sense, you know, that makes no sense. But that has led to a lot of misdiagnosis of things that actually are UIP as other things. They try to make it into sarcoidosis, into chronic HP, all kinds of like a grab bag of things that is just trying to force th things into non-UIP just because there's more fibrosis in the upper lobes. So that's not necessarily true. What you should remember though is that, that the general rule is more fibrosis in the periphery and more fibrosis in the lower. Generally, not all cases. And then here's what all of you have seen, at least the ones who have been through lung have seen. This is what it looks like on, on the gross specimen, which kind of correlates with the microscopic, right? So you get, uh, now interestingly, you can see fibrosis here and you can even see some honeycomb change grossly, right? Everybody sees it? Now interestingly, if you sample those areas that look normal, often there's fibrosis microscopically. So at every level, the microscope is better than radiology or gross. Things that look uh, normal on radiology can be fibrotic microscopically. Things that look like they have no honeycombing on radiology can have honeycombing microscopically. So it's completely wrong and insane to think that radiology is the gold standard in this disease. It cannot be. It's like saying, one person is blind and one can see, the blind person is the, is the gold standard. It just makes no sense. It's just a matter of resolution. It's not that I'm knocking radiologists. I mean, they're very, very smart people. And they have great tools. Even with high-res CT, our resolution is greater than their resolution. So we can see smaller things. We can see more detail. All right, so that's the gross. Now let's go to pathology and what I would do here is I tell you there are basically three features of UIP. Three. You can combine those two things into one which is called architecture and distortion. So what you need in UIP is a patchwork pattern, right? Normal abnormal. You need architectural distortion which means the normal lung architecture lines and air spaces. It just gets ruined by scarring or honeycomb change. Both of which distort the architecture, right? Architectural scarring and honeycomb change. So you need number one, number two, and number three, which we have already seen what a fibroblast focus looks like. So those three things make UIP. And then there are mimics, but they basically that's what you have to learn, what things can mimic this appearance. But most of the time when you have those three criteria, you're dealing with UIP. So this is what a patchwork pattern looks like. Is it clear to everybody? Lower left is abnormal. Upper right is normal. The lower left also shows architectural distortion, right? That's all distorted architecture. And there are areas of honeycomb change here. There are scarred areas without honeycomb change, like here. That's a scar without honeycomb change. And there's honeycomb change here. There's actually an interlock septum separating the two areas in this case. So normal lung and abnormal lung. Got it, everyone? Patchwork pattern. This is a fibroblast focus. Classic, right? I actually heard recently somebody saying, you can't tell fibroblast foci from, you can't tell UIP from organizing pneumonia and histology. It only happens in textbooks. That's not a textbook, that's a real life picture. It's, I acknowledge that sometimes it's hard, it can be hard. I mean, in airspace, interstitial, 
it's not an easy thing but sometimes it's just classic you know it's in the interstitium it's dome shaped there are no inflammatory cells within it there's none of the branching configuration that you see in organized pneumonia so this is a classic fibroblast focus and the uh, importance of the, this was this um, uh, the importance of this was kind of highlighted by dr myers and katzenstein a long time back in i think in the 80s um, and what they showed is that these areas are the areas that are actively producing fibrosis in UIP. So these are the areas that drive activity. And that's why UIP is a progressive or relentlessly progressive disease. Because it doesn't just make collagen and stop there. It makes collagen and the fibroblast force I make more and more and more and more. And then the epithelial part of the thing produces honeycomb change. So this is a bad disease. And these foci are thought to be the areas that drive progression. Is that clear to everybody? Any questions about fibroblast foci or the patchwork pattern? And there's a difference, of course, between established collagen, which looks like the thing on the left, and then ongoing fibrosis like you get in fibroblast foci. That should be clear to everybody. So there is, in the uh, old days, this used to be called spatial heterogeneity. Temporal and spatial heterogeneity. Now here's honeycomb change at a microscopic level. So the left hand side shows you honeycomb change in the periphery of the lung, right? Everyone can see that? And then this is what it looks microscopically. So what you get is, just imagine that you have bronchiolar epithelium in the, in the bronchiole, right? Like you expect, and in the respiratory bronchiole. Now the lung itself doesn't have any bronchiolar epithelium, right? Now there, are, there is a process in which bronchiolar epithelium starts growing into the normal lung alveolar septa. Anyone knows what that's called? Bronchiolization. Peribronchial metaplasia. It's a, just a metaplastic process. Supposed to be some sort of an, either an early form of honeycomb change or a form of lung injury or a form of lung fibrosis. But that is sort of like a precursor where epithelium is starting to grow into the adjacent alveoli, but there is no dilatation, there's no mucin formation, there is, might be mild fibrosis. But as this thing progresses, these spaces become bigger and then they get filled with mucin. They get dilated and filled with mucin. And at that point, when you have mucin filled dilated spaces in a fibrotic background adjacent to normal bronchioles. So remember, this is not a, it's not the bronchiole that's abnormal. It's, it's going into the adjacent lung. That is called honeycomb change. And that area, so just imagine now this area that used to be a good alveolus is now lined with bronchiolar epithelium instead of alveolar. The airspace which used to be normal is now filled with mucin. The surrounding alveolar septa which used to be normal are now fibrotic and scarred and distorted. Will this area now function well as normal? No. So honeycomb change is actually a very bad thing. Honeycomb change is a uh, um, process that has indicated that the fibrosis has now become irreversible. And the next step of this is these things become even bigger and more mucin filled and eventually you can see it grossly and radiologically and at that point even they can make a diagnosis of UIP. So it goes from microscopic honeycomb change to macroscopically <coughs> invisible honeycomb change. Eventually the whole lung becomes honeycombed as the thing progresses more and more and more. Okay, is that clear to everybody? You can also see why honeycomb change can be, initially when you see it can be a little disturbing. You know, you see all this epithelium, you go, well, this, this is a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma. Like it, it can be, but those cells are ciliated, you know, so it's very easy to tell them apart. Ciliated, bland, filled with mucin. All right, this is a, uh, what am I showing you, anybody? What's left and what's right? Honeycomb, Honeycomb on the left. Brachiectasis right. on the right. Actually, the right is a case of cystic fibrosis. Do you see the difference? It's very marked. I mean, true, there is some similarity in that they're slightly cystic, but in, in cystic fibro, in, in bronchiectasis, those are normal bronchi that are dilated and inflamed. It's not a going into the alveolar distorting process. On the left side, that those are not normal bronchi. The only thing normal there, like a, a is that up there. That's it, that's traction bronchiectasis. But all of this stuff is honeycomb change. Okay, clear to everybody? And here's the microscopic of that. 
So top left is bronchiac is um, is honeycomb change. You see that it's the epithelium has grown into all the alveoli, replaced it. Those are dilated mucin filled spaces. Actually, top right shows you what normal lung should look like in that picture. The top right of that picture. That's honeycomb change. Now look at traction bronchiectasis. It's just a bronchus that's bigger, very different. But radiologically, there is some overlap between these things. Like a big honeycomb cyst can look similar to traction bronchiectasis to them. And they, you know, it, again, I don't blame them. Their resolution is low. They're doing the best they can with what they can see. But, but you see a lot more on histology. And this is the high mag of the same. Clear to everyone? This is what we talked about uh, as to why biopsies are done for UIP. Is that clear to everyone? Why do we need to know if, if it's UIP or not? What what is the alternative? What what else might they find in these ILD biopsies? Can you can somebody give me some examples? If everything is not UIP, what are the other things? In the different hypersensitivity pneumonitis, organizing pneumonia, NSIP, anything else? Fibrotic sarcoidosis happens sometimes. Anything else? There's a smoking related disease that can get fibrotic. LCH. So Langerhans cell histiocytosis can get fibrotic in late stages and look a lot, a lot like UIP. So that's another, you know, um, the classic literature says asbestosis, but I'm, I'm just going to leave it here. The classic literature says asbestosis. Uh, collagen vascular diseases, right? So if you have rheumatoid arthritis, that can give you a picture that is very similar to UIP. And in fact, you can say it is just UIP in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis. That can happen. Um, so that's basically your differential. So that when they give you a biopsy, they are looking for you to tell between these things. And the worst thing you can possibly give them is UIP, right? Because UIP is a poor prognosis disease, and then it goes into the clinician's hands. Here's beautiful pictures that Frido took actually when he was an observer here like a couple of years ago. And, and this shows you how you can have, see that oval circle on the gross? You don't see any honeycomb in there, right? On the gross, but now look at the, the microscopic. There is microscopic honeycomb change in that area. It just shows you beautifully in exactly the same area that you can have grossly non-visible changes that look just like fibrosis, but on the microscopic, they are honeycomb change. Here's another example that shows you grossly, you can't see what the honey, so actually the, the picture on the left, the red arrows show you where you can see honeycomb change, right? And that's not included in the microscopic. The microscopic is only the area within the, the purple square or rectangle and in there you can see you can't see honeycomb change grossly but you can see it microscopically. Same thing with radiology. There are many, many, many instances where you cannot see honeycomb change radiologically but you can see it microscopically. So the burden is on us. What's happening in this picture is that in the gross, so the purple again is the area of the microscopic. Does everyone get that? Mm -hmm. So the red area is where you do see honeycomb change grossly and it's seen on the microscopic. Then the green is where you can't really see it grossly and it's also present on the microscopic. Mm -hmm. So why I'm showing you this is the gross is a very good approximation to what happens on radiology. They just can't be sure whether something uh, they're seeing is uh, honeycomb change or, or just fibrosis. And that's very critical when you're trying to tell you what UIP from NSIP is whether there's any coming or not. What is this, guys? Fibroblast focus, yeah. Dome shape, no inflammation within the interstitial. What am I showing you here? Contrast. The contrast between what and what? Focus and plug. Yes, focus and plug. <laughs> Left upper is focus, right lower is plug. Left upper is UIP, right lower is organizing the body. Totally wrong to say that you can't tell these apart. <laughs> and then let's talk about treatment and prognosis. There is no effective therapy for you for UIP and IPF. There are two drugs, perfenidone and nintendinib. And uh, you know, I, I posted on Twitter once that they, these drugs are. You know, there's very minimal evidence that they are effective, and I got a lot of like blowback from ILD clinicians. 
uh, saying I'm a nihilist and this and that. But let me tell you what, what the evidence is. There, there are two big, or actually more than two, but there are two big trials, randomized control trials that came out. They are drug company sponsored, so remember that. That came out where they looked at people who got this therapy versus versus a control and what the only thing that changed in the people who got the therapy was that they were measuring the feb1 and it declined just as in the people who didn't you know the control now it declined but it declined slower mm -hmm. than it declined in that one so what can you tell the patient i mean is this a, is a victory for for therapy you say you are going to die you're going to die at a high rate like it, it at you know some worse than some cancers right you you don't die of carcinoid too much you don't die of low grade you know benign gists but you die of uib and and the median survival is 3 to 4 years so you're going to tell the patient you're going to die of this disease the treatment i'm going to give you is not going to cure you you're going to go to lung transplant or or you might die without any effective therapy but guess what your fev1 will decline slower than it did before Right, so I'm not poking fun at the trial. I mean, it, it showed some benefit, okay? But is that really a tre effective treatment? I don't think it's effective treatment. But you'll hear everywhere, two drugs are available for you. Yeah, drugs are available for everything. Doesn't mean that it works. So those are that's the therapy for this. What happens in real life to UIP patients? They come to transplant or, or there's no hope for them. They come to transplant. And you've seen those cases here, right? Patients who are end stage and they get a transplant and then there's you know another hope for for a couple of years of life is their response to steroid the same clinicians who are now experts on ild used to tell us that steroids are the treatment for uip the same it's the same group of people right for years they've been telling us steroid steroid this is an alveolitis and cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis so they used to give these patients steroids then you know what they did they did another trial which showed that steroids were actually harming these patients they were harming them instead of helping it. Because theory, you know, they were, they were all operating from theory and they said, well, everything, you know, the fibrosis starts with inflammation and if you treat the inflammation, then, you know, you will stop the fibrosis. No, that's all theory. In practice, nothing is helped by giving patients steroids. So at least one thing, good thing has happened in clinical practice is they have stopped giving steroids to people, people who have UIP because we, we know that it doesn't help. No. As a pathologist, just think of it. Does it make any sense that you would give steroids to the honeycomb chain and it would reverse? Or you'd have all that scarring and architectural distortion, it would go away with steroids. It makes no sense. It only makes sense if you're, you know, a theoretical person trying trying with theory to treat these things. So no steroids, lung transplantation, poor prognosis. Okay. Any questions about treatment prognosis of, of UIB IPS? We haven't what touched on IPS yet. What is the target of these medications? So what they're trying to do if, if essentially is reduce the fibroblast proliferation and re, you know so reduce the rate at which fibroblasts proliferate and then produce collagen that leads to UIP. That's really that's the theoretical. And I think it's a good aim, you know, it's a good aim to try to do that. But the uh, but the effect of that is not that it reverses fibrosis. It never reverses fibrosis. It never you know, you, nev you never get a patient who had UIP first and then they have clear lungs after they took propranolol. So I'm skeptical about this. I'm skeptical about the treatment of UIP so far. We need better, we need better therapies. So one thing before we go to NSIP is the relationship between UIP and IPM. So can anybody tell me what is the relationship between UIP and IPM? Anyone? You know, is the classic clinic finding for IPM. Yeah. But it's not too, not necessarily too for the MRI. Yes, so tell me, Ahmad, um, so he's saying UIP is what we, pathologic diagnosis, and IPF is the clinical diagnosis. So what does the clinician take into account before they make the diagnosis? The clinical when the patient have symptoms of, like the spirometer measurements and they're usually two sources. Like yes, one. so tell me something where we could give them a UIP diagnosis, but they would make a non-IPF diagnosis. Can anyone think of that? There's a mixed disease for them. Yes. So there is there that's one situation which actually comes up fairly frequently. Somebody has rheumatoid arthritis, then they develop lung disease, they have radiologic findings of bilateral interstitial lung disease, they get a biopsy, we think it's UIP. Right? In that setting, the clinician can say, No, I don't think this UIP is idiopathic. 
I think it's related to his rheumatoid arthritis. And it, it, the issue is actually more complicated by that than that, but currently how it stands is that clinician has the final say on how they want to label it. So in that situation, they call it connective tissue disease related <laughs> interstitial lung disease. CTD, ILD is what they call it. Or rheumatoid arthritis associated interstitial lung disease or rheumatoid arthritis associated UIP. It's up to them, right? And there are similar other situations. Again, asbestosis is one. I don't want to go into that because I don't agree with how currently things are. But that's another situation where clinicians could say, look, this guy has asbestos exposure. He has pleural plaques. I think this is asbestosis, not IPM. So currently that's how it, it um, is that clinicians have the final say to label something IPM. And I think that's completely fair. But who has the final say on UIP? We do. Yes. Can a clinician make a diagnosis of UIP just without, without any pathology, without radiologic findings? The truth is, guys, and this is very difficult to say in a room full of clinicians, there's not even ILD without, before radiology comes into the picture. Clinicians, just by taking a history, can't do anything. You need a, at least a radiology to even bring up that possibility that there is ILD. So the fact that the person with the least information has the biggest say in the discussion is really amazing in this situation. You know? But uh, it's in, important for you guys to know that the role of the pathologist is the diagnosis of UIP here. And then, then it goes to the clinician. Is that clear? Yeah. Would you diagnose as UIP or UIP pattern? UIP is what I call. So UIP, okay, let, let, this is a very good question. UIP pattern is something that people come up with. You know why they say that? Is that they say, well, if, if the actual diagnosis is IPF, you know, the final, then UIP is just a pattern that can be seen in many different ways. That's the, right? They say UIP pattern can be seen in connective tissue disease and asbestosis and this. So let me give you um, a corollary. Um, you see, uh, Granulomas, right, in sarcoidosis. Do we say granuloma pattern? It's a pattern, right? We know that's not sarcoid, always. We see adenocarcinoma, sometimes that turn, turns out to be EGFR mutated, sometimes it's KRAS mutated, sometimes it's stage four, sometimes it's stage one. Do we say adenocarcinoma pattern? The point I'm getting at is that's obvious that it's a pattern, right? Every pathologic diagnosis is in a sense it's a pattern and can be modified by extra clinical information, right? and they can make further judgments on it. So it's kind of useless to say pattern in that situation. I think what pattern really means is, and this is my opinion, I think people say pattern when they're not sure that it's UIP. They go, well, I'm just saying pattern. I'm not <laughs> saying it's UIP. So that's really the, the truth behind this pattern business. If you know the patient has connective tissue disease, yes, it's still UIP. UIP. Yeah, why not? If the, if the pathology criteria are met, it is UIP. In fact, there is actually pretty good evidence that regardless of the underlying setting, right, regardless of what <coughs> is causing the UIP, if you have UIP on pathology, it behaves identically, the same. It's poor prognosis and relentless. So tell me, if that's what dictates the prognosis, what's more important, the pathologic diagnosis or the clinical label? I mean, I'm talking to a room full of pathologists, so I won't get any argument on you. But <laughs> if you tell clinicians this, they get very, very mad about that. You know, that it doesn't matter what they label it. The pathology is what drives everything. But do you understand that, Sukha, what I'm saying? Okay. Do we have time? We have only eight minutes. Okay, so we'll do one more, just one more entity. So interestingly, uh, NSIP, does anyone know um, who, who figured out it? the entity NSIP. How about clinicians? If it raise the hand that, um, who thought a clinician figured out this entity? Well, it's so important, right? Who thought a radiologist figured it out? No? How about a multi, the multidisciplinary conferences that is, <laughs> right? Who thought that a multidisciplinary group of clinician, radiologists, and pathologists figured out what NSIP was? Nobody. So what's left? Pathologist. It was a pathologist. Actually, the the paper that described NSIP was written by a pathologist and a PA, pathologist assistant. It's Kazenstein and Fiorelli. If you read the original paper, that's 1994. Right? And what she noted, actually, she was in a private practice hospital at the time, getting consult cases of ILDs. That's how she she was she was famous and world famous at that time too. 
but she got consult cases and what she noticed was that what clinicians thought was IPF, right? They said IPF biopsy, IPF biopsy, that not all of them looked the same pathologically. You know, some things look like what we call UIP now, but there was no, at that time, everything was IPF, right? But she questioned that dogma. She said that, but it's not all the same. Some of this stuff doesn't look like you, doesn't have that pattern. It looks a bit different. And she noticed, again, this is observation. She noticed those patients tend to be a little younger. Some of them tend to have either connective tissue disease or hypersensitivity. They tend to do much better in the long run. Some of them respond to steroids. So she thought, man, this is not all one thing, you know? It's two different things. One is like a bad thing that looks a certain way on UIP and uh, on pathology and behaves badly. Another is a kind of more uniform thing pathologically, behaves a little different, the patients are different. So she wrote a paper, it came out in American Journal of Search Path, Katzenstein and Fiorelli, saying non-specific interstitial pneumonia slash fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And she came up with the idea that this is this should be separated out and, and is a different entity. And then for years and years and years, clinicians have been validating that idea. I mean, they have validated it. It's, it's clearly a valid proposal and now everybody accepts it, right? Everybody accepts that NSIP is a, is a different thing. So what that looks like is this. Actually, SRIF was not a bad thought for this because SRIF also has this pattern. And my suspicion is many things that were called NSIP in the past are actually SRIF because they are very similar looking, right? The difference is only that the inflammation is more in NSIP and it's much more uniform. More inflammation and much more uniform. SRIF is a little patchy, tends, tends to be more in the subpleural region, tends to be more around respiratory bronchioles, and the emphysema is more prominent and RB is as well. But there is there is overlap between the two things. And this so this is what NSIP looks like. Very diffuse interstitial thickening. So on top of this, if you have any architectural distortion and honeycomb when patchwork, that becomes UIP. So UIP trumps NSIP. And you see this commonly in explant lungs, right? So there's, I don't, we just saw one, I think, yesterday. UIP, 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 but some areas in between look like NSIP. That is UIP. UIP trumps. Just like cancer, can, benign, benign, benign cancer, that whole thing is cancer. Right? That's how, it, how that works in, in ILD. So this is what NSIP is. And this is take home points for UIP and NSIP. I'll give you a second to look at this. Everybody okay with these points? You will get asked again and again in the rise and board, which is the poorer prognosis, UIP or NSIP? Should be clear to everybody now? And the pathologic criteria? Okay, I think we will stop and we'll go back. We'll, let's go back to the, <coughs> to the pictures and we'll end it there, okay? So let's go back to the where we started. Give me a little there. All right, so this is hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and that's because it looks like a cellular NSIP picture, but there's occasional multi cancer. This is a classic form of interstitial lung disease. This one is a fibroblast focus and UIP, you guys know, right? This one is organizing pneumonia in a needle biopsy. It often gives the appearance of opacities or mass or even, or even bilateral ILD. This one is NSIP. But looks, I, I totally get that it mimics SRIF. This is alveolar proteinosis. Why it's not pneumocystis is, it, although pneumocystis also fills the air spaces, Right in a similar way with granular material, you get these little chunk, you get these chunky pieces of kind of surfactant material that blob into globules in that. <clears throat> and the important thing in that distinguishes uh, PAP and PCP is in PCP you see little dots within the frothy material. Even on the HNE, you can actually see those those dots are are the organism. And one more clue which I was hinting at before is in PAP the alveolar receptors are normal. In PCP, they tend to be a little bit abnormal. There is inflammation and so forth. So uh, there is overlap, no question about it. And it's not a bad idea to do a GMS when you're thinking of a uh, PAP diagnosis. All right, thank you guys. Thank you for your attention.